And then additionally, we have George Stern, and I will be the chat monitor. Yes. Uh, we are all volunteers with March on Harrisburg, a pro-democracy, anti-corruption, nonpartisan, grassroots organization dedicated to passing laws that build a strong democracy in Pennsylvania. We believe we can create a government of, by, and for the people, a government that's rooted in democracy and responsive to the needs of the people rather than the demands of special interests and big money. Today, we're here to talk about how one of the most fundamental pieces of our democracy, the way we vote, is actually fueling our problems and how ranked choice voting can make our votes more meaningful and impactful. To start off, can you please give a physical thumbs up or down as to whether you've heard of ranked choice voting? So thumbs up if you've like heard of it, general idea. Okay, we just wanna, you know, figure out the crowd and people's level of understanding. So one thing to note as we continue through the presentation, please don't hesitate to interrupt to ask clarifying questions if we say something you don't understand, but otherwise please hold your questions and comments until the end or post questions in the chat and George will take a look at them. Uh, but by the way, we don't encourage you to put comments there, better to watch and listen and there will be a space and time for um, questions at the end. Can I ask when, when is the end? Um, this will, the presentation aspect will end around like 735, 740, and then we'll do 20 minutes for questions. Okay. So take a moment now, please, to consider how you would personally answer the following questions. You'll see in a few minutes that your responses are relevant to the ranked choice voting process that we will describe here today. So please give a thumbs up or a thumbs down for each question that we ask you. But first off, with the question we currently have on the screen, Thinking about our elected officials, do you think that they represent a majority of the people or just their base? If you think they represent a majority of the people, thumbs up. If it's just their base, thumbs down. Okay, all right. Okay. Shall I go to the... Definitely a lot more thumbs down, thumbs up, right, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next question is, do you enjoy voting for a lesser of two evils instead of the candidate that you agree with the most? Seeing thumbs down. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Thirdly, do you think our politicians campaign in a constructive and unifying way? Thumbs up for yes, thumbs down for no. <laughs> yeah, seeing no's as in general. That much is obvious. And then finally, do you trust your government to do the right thing all or most of the time? I'm seeing no's. <laughs> Okay. Out of two thumbs down and get those. I love up. a passionate <laughs> thumbs down <laughs> or a thumbs up, either way. If you're skeptical, you're not alone. Uh, since 2010, only 15 to 24 percent of U.S. citizens have said they trust our government to do the right thing all or most of the time. Many are rightfully frustrated with our government, our political system, and even voting. And in fact, we'd argue that the voting system most widely used in America, the foundation of our democracy, is actually what's fueling our problems. We will explain today exactly what we mean by that and how we can and must do better. So what determines the winner of an election in the United States? The answer is not as simple as you may think. Many assume that because we live in a democracy, the winner of our elections is supported by a majority of the people. But unfortunately, that isn't quite how it works. In national and most state and municipal elections in the US, plurality rules, not a majority. Here's what that means. A winner-takes-all voting system consists of a system in which the candidate with the highest vote total wins, even if that candidate receives less than 50% of the total vote. They win by a plurality, not a majority. This is the system in Pennsylvania. In a majority voting system, the winner must receive at least 50% of total votes. In a few states, runoff elections occur when no candidate reaches that 50% threshold. In front of you is a visual comparing the results of winner-takes-all and majority systems. On the pie chart we see on the left, using a winner-takes-all vote system like we have in Pennsylvania, the majority voted for yellow or purple combined. However, dark blue nevertheless won because it received the most votes, 
a plurality, even though it was less than 50%. So the will of the majority, that is yellow and purple together, is ultimately thwarted. On the right, we have a true majority winner because dark blue received greater than 50% of the vote. This winner takes all system is at the heart of many of the problems plaguing our democracy today. For example, under this winner takes all system, you can vote for only one candidate, no matter how many might be on the ballot. In these elections, voters often decide that because their preferred candidate is very unlikely to win, they instead vote for the candidate they like best from among those they believe are more likely to win. That's better, they decide, than wasting their vote on a candidate who most probably won't be able to win. But by choosing the lesser of two evils, they fail to express through their vote what's most important to them. In a way, they disenfranchise themselves, even though they're ultimately voters. Moreover, what they really care about remains a secret, even from other candidates who might be willing to consider new ideas if they understand that some voters are motivated by them. The terrible lesser of two evils trap was on full display in the 2000 US presidential election in Florida. The winner, George Bush, won without reaching 50% of the vote. He had only 537 more votes than the second place finisher, Al Gore. The third place candidate, Ralph Nader, had 97,488 votes. Pat Buchanan and Harry Brown had another 34,000 between them. Reliable polls prior to the election showed Nader winning three times as many votes as he received. There's a good chance that, at the last minute, voters decided that they had to choose between the lesser of two evils, between Bush, Bush or Gore, lest the other of the two front runners whom they really didn't like would win. Put another way, many voters felt that they only had two choices, both undesirable. Vote their conscience and possibly end up with a the candidate they liked least, or hold their nose and vote for Bush or Gore. This lesser of two evil situation traps frustrated voters. It serves both Democrats and Republicans by discouraging challengers from alternative parties. Winner takes all voting is responsible for what we call the spoiler effect, which happens when voters are split between candidates with similar ideologies, paving the way for a lesser like candidate to spoil the race by receiving a plurality of the total votes cast. Here's a chart of the results of the 2016 Democratic primary election for the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. Katie McGinty, Joe Sestak, John Fetterman, and Joseph Vodvarka ran in the primary. Behind the scenes, party leaders used the spoiler effect to their own advantage, or so they thought. They preferred McGinty, a moderate, but early polls show that Sestak, a progressive whose independent streak rubbed them the wrong way, was more popular among voters. So party leaders encouraged Fetterman, a progressive like Sestak, to enter the race. In the primary, the two progressives, Sestak and Fetterman, together garnered more than half of the vote. But because they split the progressive vote, McGinty, McGinty won the nomination with only 42.5% of the vote, a plurality, but not a majority. Many Democratic voters felt disenfranchised, which depressed their turnout in the November general election. What was the upshot of the party playing its own spoiler effect hand? In the general election with a less enthused Democratic electorate, McGinty lost to Pat Toomey, who also won with less than 50% of the vote, not a majority. So if our winner takes all system harms our democracy, how can we be sure the people we elect have the support of at least 50% of the voters? There must be a better way. Thanks to Ranked Choice Voting, RCV for short, there definitely is. RCV lets you rank multiple candidates in the order you prefer them. You can think of it as an instant runoff election, but one that has no additional cost. Here's how ranking your candidates in the order that you prefer gets us to a winner that a majority of voters can support. In the scenario you see in front of you, showing the first results of this election, the dark blue candidate received more than half the votes. Under ranked choice voting, that cam candidate simply wins. Still, people could vote their conscience knowing that a full ranked choice voting process would take place if no one got 50%. Here, however, no one got 50% or more in the vote in the first round, so what we might call an instant runoff needs to take place. The candidate with the fewest votes will be eliminated, and voters who pick that candidate as number one will have their votes reallocated to their second choice. Here in round two, the candidate with the fewest votes has been eliminated and their votes have been reallocated to the voter's second choice. Still no candidate has a majority, so the elimination reallocation process will continue. 
Here at last, a candidate has at least half the votes. RCV has done its job electing a candidate that a majority of voters prefer over the candidates eliminated. Since ranked choice voting is new for many people, we'd also like to share a short video that in just 90 seconds reviews the process we've just described to you. Politics is tearing us apart, and it's because elections aren't working for most of us. Here's why. In the US, each of us can vote for the candidate we like the most, but whenever more than two candidates are running to win one seat, it's possible for most voters to hate whoever wins. Because of the split vote, Politicians can ignore the will of most voters and still win. Ranked choice voting gives you the freedom to select a backup choice to prevent that from happening. Let's say a group uses ranked choice voting to decide what to eat for dinner tonight. Each voter selects their favorite dish, but also has the option to choose backup dishes. If one food receives more than half the votes, it wins, just like in any other election. But let's get to dessert, where the competition is more fierce. What if no ice cream flavor has more than 50% of the vote? Under a normal race, vanilla would win, even though a majority of voters didn't pick it. With ranked choice voting, the flavor with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who chose that flavor as number one will have their votes count for their next choice. Everyone gets a say, no one wastes their vote, and the winner is the flavor that the largest number of people agreed upon. That's ranked choice voting. It's as easy as one, two, three. You get more voice and more choice, and that makes elections better for all of us. So let's consider some of the benefits of ranked choice voting. First, RCV eliminates the spoiler effect and lesser of two evils voting. Voters no longer have to game out who is the most electable. They can follow their conscience and vote for any candidate, knowing that their vote won't be wasted. If their first choice is eliminated, their vote goes to their second choice, a process which reads and repeats until there is a clear majority winner. There's no penalty for voting first for who you believe in, even if that candidate is not the most likely to win. Knowing that you can vote your conscience is certainly an incentive to engage in the electoral process. Winner-takes-all elections discourage candidates from historically marginalized groups like women and people of color from entering a race in which there's already another woman or candidate of color running. They feel like they don't want to split the women's vote or the black vote, for example, so neither the woman or nor black candidate wins. Ranked choice voting avoids that issue and encourages a larger, more diverse field of candidates, all of whom have a chance to win, as a reallocation process proceeds. Research from a group called Represent Women shows that more women and people of color run in elections using ranked choice voting and that they win more often. At least seven cities that use ranked choice voting for council elections have achieved gender parity. Winner takes all rules also innately encourage toxic campaigning. Under winner takes all, candidates find it easiest to distinguish themselves from other candidates in the field by using negative, divisive, and toxic campaigning. This slide shows two separate campaign ads, one each for Democrat Tom Wolf and Republican Scott Wagner. Each candidate uses his ad simply to criticize the other. In our current system, instead of campaigning on issues voters care about, candidates can simply campaign against each other without explaining why people should vote for them. Often people end up voting out of fear because they don't really know which candidate best reflects their values, or they just don't vote. Toxic campaigning and outright lying affects everything from school board races to presidential elections. It leaves voters feeling dissatisfied, exhausted, bewildered, and disgusted with what we call democracy. The mudslinging and bad blood, which are promoted and encouraged by a winner-takes-all system, make it difficult for voters to rally behind a candidate in a general election who attacked their favorite candidate in the primary. And it also makes it hard for political opponents to govern together after the election. On the other hand, Ranked choice voting can incentivize candidates to work together. On the left of the slide in front of you is a photo of two candidates who campaigned cooperatively in San Francisco, focusing on the issues that both campaigns cared about. Encourage voters to vote for each of them on the ballot as number one and number two, recognizing that either candidate would address the issue the voter cared about. Ranked choice voting encouraged them to appeal to a majority of voters and not just their base, because they need to be sure they rank high among voters for whom they are not the first choice. This leads to more campaigning in neighborhoods that are often overlooked. 
Ranked choice voting helps prevent politicians from dividing and conquering us. Bottom line, nobody is enthusiastic about voting if they truly prefer none of the above. Ranked choice voting eliminates those impediments that too easily lead voters to conclude that their vote doesn't matter and that they shouldn't try at all. Many studies have shown that RCV actually draws more voters to the polls. Elections are more meaningful when people believe that their opinions matter. Ranked choice voting lets we the people choose our leaders, which in turn encourages greater participation in our democracy. And we do have proof that ranked choice voter voting matters in this regard. Minneapolis and St. Paul experienced a 9.6% increase in voter turnout when they adopted ranked choice voting. In the 2021 New York City mayoral primary, using ranked choice voting for the first time, more people voted than at any time in the last 30 years. Even more exciting, studies have shown that under ranked choice voting, the effect on turnout is higher in precincts with higher poverty rates, which is likely because candidates have to campaign in those precincts and share their visions in order to gain votes. According to a recent study, candidates were 25% more likely to reach out to voters in person in cities that use ranked choice voting than in cities that don't. It's no question that more people vote under ranked choice voting. And now some people have said, come on, RCV will never happen here. But actually, ranked choice voting is far from a pipe dream. It's gaining momentum across the US. Two states, Maine and Alaska, have adopted it statewide. Six more states in the South have adopted it for absentee balloting and for military service members. And cities big and small in nearly half the states are introducing and using it in their elections. In the 2021 New York City primary, exit polling showed that 78% of New Yorkers said they understood ranked choice voting extremely or very well. 95% found the ballot simple to complete and 77% of voters want to use RCV in future elections. Here's a map that shows you the progress ranked choice voting is already making in the United States. Maine and Alaska have used ranked choice voting statewide for federal elections and in Alaska for state and local elections as well. Light purple states such as Nevada have used ranked choice voting for the 2020 presidential primaries, whereas states in dark purple like New York have reenacted ranked choice voting in, in local elections. Additionally, magenta states have used ranked choice voting, voting for party elections and states in teal, mainly in the South, such as Louisiana, use ranked choice voting for military and overseas voters. And ranked choice voting is used by democracies all around the world in countries in Europe, Asia and beyond. Australia and Ireland have both been using it for over a century. So you might be wondering, how do we bring ranked choice voting into Pennsylvania? A handful of ranked choice voting bills have been submitted to committees of the state legislature by different representatives. We at March on Harrisburg have studied them and believe that they are deficient or unlikely to pass because they lack true bipartisan support. We're pleased to tell you that we've been working hard to produce a bipartisan ranked choice voting bill for submission to the legislature. Members on both sides of the aisle have expressed interest and we're meeting with potential co-sponsors. The bill would amend current election law and not require a constitutional amendment. Provisions will include the local implementation of ranked choice voting where municipalities will be allowed to implement ranked choice voting locally, providing opportunities for careful assessment before it's considered to go statewide. It'll be also include a codified tabulation process, which includes rules for tabulating results that must be laid out clearly in the legislation. There are also provisions for single and multi-winner elections, where ranked choice voting can be used in elections where only one candidate will win, and where voters can choose multiple candidates as well, like in the Philadelphia City Council. Finally, there will be an option for write-ins, uh, and enabling the provision for write-ins to be permitted in elections. The bill will also require that all voting machines be programmed for RCV. Almost all voting machines currently in use in Pennsylvania are programmable, and if not, a provision must be made for replacing them. There has to be a voter education movement on RCV. Political entities that currently use RCV have emphasized the importance of careful and widespread voter education prior to the first RCV vote. There also has to be a six month lead time. Once RCV legislation passes, a required six month window will allow for education and tweaking if necessary. And it also requires that there be a sample ballots for voters. That will be an important part of the education process, but can only occur once all candidates have been certified. In order to make ranked choice voting a reality, March and Harrisburg members have met with Governor Shapiro's transition team and started identifying lead co-sponsors from both parties. 
We've also begun scheduling meetings with every state representative and senator from both parties so that we can get more early sign-ons and make certain every legislator understands ranked choice voting and the significance of this change. RCV can come our way if we make it so. It's up to us to build a democracy of, by, and for the people. Being in charge of the decisions that govern our lives will allow us to come together to solve our collective problems and build a state and country that's more representative of and responsive to we the people. And we urge you to join our ranked choice voting efforts and that's easy for you to do right now. Please take a moment now to fill out our survey whose link we're currently putting in the chat to let us know what capacity you were able to get involved with us in. It won't take more than a minute or two. So we're gonna pause and let you guys like take a minute. It just asks for name, email address, uh, and, if, and what you're interested in getting involved in. Okay. And everyone can come back to it if they if they need more time. We can continue. So next up, you should follow us on social media. So you can find us posting RCV spe specific content on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at the at voter choice PA. And then you can also find the overarching March on Harrisburg account on Instagram and Twitter under the handle at NPA Corruption and on TikTok at March underscore on underscore Harrisburg. And all the links are being dropped in the chat as well. Now we have an activity for everyone. We're gonna take a couple of minutes to contact our legislators. You can use the link in the chat to input your address and it will automatically populate with your representatives and create a draft email for you to send to them. Feel free to tailor the language to your voice and be sure to sign your name at the end. Contacting your legislator shows that there is more widespread support for ranked choice voting in Pennsylvania. So it should be the Action Network um, link that says ask your representative if they support ranked choice voting. And the way it works is you'll just like put in your name and your address and it'll auto populate your rep and then it'll auto populate a letter. So feel free to like, you know, tailor it and sign in at the end and you just hit submit and it'll email them for you, which is really cool. Makes it very easy. <laughs> I'm gonna give everyone an extra minute to do that because this that takes a little bit more time. Yeah, feel free. Oh, someone got an error on submission. Uh oh, no. <laughs> um, I'm looking at it right now. I was just going to ask Andrea if you can. I was going to say the same thing. I got an error. No. No, that's not good. <laughs> a hurdle. No, we're fine. It's able to be fixed, but we can do is you can come back around and drop yeah, the Yeah, at the end drop and give everyone a second. Yeah. Let's do that. Andrea, I'll let you um, troubleshoot there and we will continue on for now. Hopefully you will have an opportunity. If not, <laughs> we'll send the link later. So in addition to your volunteer time, we can also always use your voluntary donations to help fund our movement for better democracy. Um, all donations are welcome, and we invite you to consider these special categories in which $1,500 sponsors one part-time organizer for one month, $200, $250 organizes a community-powered grassroots lobbying team to convert a legislator to yes, $100 sponsors a speaking engagement, $50 sports canvassing an event to get supporters, and we put the link in the chat where you can donate securely. And again, if you're like, oh, I'm so busy, I don't have any volunteer time, that's okay, because 
we do, but we need funding. So um, that's always a great alternative option. Feel free to support. As you know, there is much work to be done to build a truly representative democracy. Passing ranked choice voting alone can't possibly build the democracy we need and deserve, but it's an important step. March on Harrisburg has a full money out, people in platform, and we're moving. So please join us in the fight for ranked choice voting and for our other campaigns to get money out of politics, make our votes meaningful, and make democracy work for all of us. Our general website is www.mohpa.org, which will also be dropped in the chat. Uh, so finally, thank you so much for participating with us today. And now it is time for Q&A. Any questions, we're happy to hear any comments answer all questions. And again, just thank you for joining us. I will stop sharing now.